The journey from ideation to creation is powered by imagination. It's the gateway between reality and possibility, connecting emotion and inspiration to enable innovation. And it all starts when we're free to imagine how things could be instead of how they are. When we possess the solutions that let us imagine together, relationships transcend into experiences. It allows collaboration and creativity to become one, creating a spark capable of propelling humanity forward. Now is the time to dream collectively, to bring together new ideas and people. This is where our worlds become one, where we imagine all we can achieve together. Please welcome Tracy Wilson. Good morning and welcome to day three. I hope you have been able to connect with some of your friends in the community. It's been fun to watch you all engage on social media. During the last couple years, we learned that people across the globe can gather virtually to share meaningful causes, common goals, and collective visions. And all of those people can be designers in their own way. This week, we heard about the many tools that can enable that imagination. To learn more about a possible future of everything designed by you, please welcome Vice President of Strategy and Community, Suchit Jain. Thank you, Tracy. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever, wherever you happen to be. In a changing world, everyone designs, each individual person, from business to institutions, from local communities to cities. And we, you are at the center of it. What you do is creating unprecedented solutions and transforming the world at an exponential speed. SolidWorks is everywhere. And 3D Experience Works will give you more tools to innovate. Six million, six million of you, the designers, engineers, students, entrepreneurs, are designing and creating many of the things we see around us. Recently, I came across an interesting article in the Popular Mechanics magazine, The Future Machines of the Year 2100. The article talks about the machine revolution in 1900s, sewing machine replaced needle and thread, typewriters, replaced pens. Automobiles replaced horse-drawn carriages. This century, we have seen innovations from DNA sequencing, space explorations, autonomous cars. Popular Mechanics went ahead and asked a bunch of scientists, engineers, futurists, what will the machines in 2100 look like? Well, the answers were pointing to a future with space elevators, tiny machine swarms, flying cars, human-machine interactions. Well, we went ahead and asked the same questions to a few of you. Here's what you said. I think the future of machines is gonna be amazing. They'll be like creatures that are constantly moving, able to adapt instantly, and solve our most complicated problems. The future machines, will evolve just like we have as human beings because they're just a reflection of us. In the year 2100, machines will be grown, not manufactured. I think the most notable changes are gonna come in the forms of automation and understanding human speech. Probably not so much how the machines look, but once we start talking to all our machines, I can't help but think that's gonna affect how we talk to each other. A hundred years from now, I believe that machines are going to be a lot smarter than they are today, but we're still going to be building them out of the same principles we've been building machines out of 
forever. Namely, converting rotational energy into other forms of motion. And I do think we're still going to be designing them in SOLIDWORKS. Well, you heard it. We'll still be designing with SOLIDWORKS in 2100. Well, some of you are already on this path to create the future of everything. Mars Auto is building autonomous trucks to fully automate long haul truck operations. Mark Ar Ma Mars Auto is in a unique position to be one of the first companies to deploy driverless, driverless trucks on the road. They have already started the first autonomous freight sh uh, shipping in Korea. Dexai is enabling the kitchen of the future, where people create new recipes and focus on hospitality, while mundane tasks are outsourced to robots. Now, soon, robots in the kitchen will be as common as microwaves or dishwashers. Calibri plans to make gene therapy manufacturing more efficient, cost effective, and with a higher quality. They are creating the next generation of bioreactors, specifically designed to handle mammalian cells. And the next one here, you have seen them before on this stage, Gravity Industries. They are making possible for anyone to experience the thrill of human flight. Their individualized flight training programs offer the chance to enroll as members of an exclusive community of jet suit, suit pilots. So we are on the journey to empower and provide all the tools necessary for you to create this future of everything, to help you really create the best products in the shortest time possible. Last few years, we have talked about how cloud technologies are digitalizing experiences, enabling collaboration anywhere and from any device. 3D Experience Works portfolio is now ready. And as you saw in the last few days, our customers are already taking advantage of the expanded capabilities in design, simulation, manufacturing, and life cycle management domains. And they're doing so with the flexibility to develop products using either desktop, cloud extended, or cloud native solutions. Also, you heard from Manish and John Paolo, 3D Experience SolidWorks for Makers. This has made the world's best design tools even more accessible to the makers, hobbyists, professional engineers working on personal home projects, or just about anyone seeking to level up their design skills. Now, Manish, since you mentioned 10,000 since the launch in August last year, I have news for you. We are now over 11,000 maker licenses purchased. Our good, my good friend, Todd Blackshear, an engineer from Lincoln, Nebraska, used 3D Experience SolidWorks for makers to design the skis, which allows this 11-year-old corgi to enjoy the snow like a puppy again. Future of everything and exponential progress requires connecting people to technology. Fab Foundation has a mission to provide access to the tools, knowledge, and the financial means to educate, innovate, and invent using technology and digital fabrication to allow anyone to make anything. Since 2014, working with Fab Foundation and the Center for Bits and Atoms at MIT, Dassault Systems have established Fab Labs in Rwanda, in Bhutan, in Chile, in Nepal. I'm very excited to have the president and CEO of Fab Foundation, Sherry Lassiter, with us today. Good morning, Suchit. Well, welcome, Sherry. How Thank are you? Thank you. I am well, and it's so wonderful to be here. Well, Sherry, we have worked together for more than seven years. What is the impact this partnership is bringing? Well, first, I just want to say how much we appreciate this partnership with Dassault Systems and SolidWorks. Um, but it's as you say. Uh, you are providing the tools, all of the tools, for technology innovation and economic opportunity 
in places where you don't typically find these kinds of resources. So these are communities that are growing and that are pulling for technology to stimulate new industry, to stimulate new businesses, uh, to educate and uh, develop the next, uh, next generation of workforce and the next generation of innovators. So you're supporting these communities by providing, you know, both the digital fabrication tools, but also you know, things like 3D printers and laser cutters and CNC routers, those kinds of things. Um, but also the design software that allows, uh, allows them, our, our designers around the world, to create products, but also to drive the tools. So you're helping these communities kind of leapfrog into the 21st century. And, um, and this is a really, really uh, important and impactful foundational impact, and it's super exciting. Yeah, and, and, and I, I know Dr. O said, you know, we need to be Star Trek tomorrow, so to accelerate this impact, I know you have been talking about self-replicating fab labs. Oh, you yes. You want to expand them? <laughs> yeah, sure. So one of the longtime goals of the Global Fab Lab Network has been for a fab lab to be able to self-reproduce. Um, and this is really important when we talk about scalability and access. Um, the project is called, globally, it's called the Machines That Make Machines Project. Um, if you think about what it costs right now to put this kind of digital fabrication facility into a community, it's like around $150,000. And so that's, that's not very affordable for, uh, for, for either communities or for small businesses. Um, but the Center for Bits and Atoms at MIT, along with the Fab Lab Network, they figured out how a, a traditional Fab Lab, like what we're talking about, and we call it version 1.0, um, can make the machines of a Fab Lab uh, in a version that we call 2.0 in a fab lab for about one-tenth of the price of the off-the-shelf machine. So instead of paying $150,000 for a lab, it's possible to make one for, say, maybe $15,000. And so that makes it much more accessible. So fab labs around the world are now ready to produce Fab Lab 2.0. And uh, that's in partnership with Dassault Systems and SolidWorks. Thank you very much. That, that is fascinating, guys. If you get a chance, look into the self-replicating fab labs. We'll be doing more work with them. But it has been amazing. And along those lines, we have a, a big announcement today, right? So to, to further this impact, we are excited to announce our initiative to establish the newest fab lab in Haiti. We are working closely with the former ambassador of Haiti to the United States of America, Paul Altidor. Now, I always wanted to say this, guys. Paul is joining us live from New York. <laughs> oh, hi, Paul. It's great to see you again. I just want to say congratulations, because I think you're about to pilot the very first Fab Lab 2.0 in the world. Um, and I just kind of want to hear about how, you know, what you think this Fab Lab means to you and the potential across Haiti? Well, first of all, I want to thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Sushit. And I want, I'm very delighted uh, to, to partner with uh, Dassault System, SolidWorks, the Fab Foundation, and MIT in this uh, global movement of making certain people have access to cutting edge technology as a tool people can use to transform their lives and their communities. It is in this slide that I'm very excited to be involved in what I hope would be the first of a series of fab labs in Haiti over the next few years, where we can really help the next generation of tankers, designers, innovators of Haiti reach new heights. So this is exciting times for me personally, but also for the communities in Haiti that will be benefiting from this new fab lab 2.0. Well, pa Paul, as in the, you know, during our conversations, we have talked about what the SolidWorks community and the SO community can bring to you. So in that spirit, there are tens of thousands of engineers listening right now. You have an appeal for them? Well, you know, the, this movement of connecting people and, and, and making certain technological tools can be a, 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 a good tool for, to transform people's lives. A lot of that depends on sharing knowledge a lot, that, a lot of that depends on, on people sharing their experiences. So in that light, uh, I'm really uh, I'm making a call here so that the communities of engineers and designers can really hop on board and join this movement of sharing their experience, sharing their knowledge, 
so that the Fab Lab communities can continue to, to, to grow and expand and reach new heights. Well, uh, Paul and Sherry, thank you for being here. And we'll definitely, Paul, spread the message and uh, create means by which to connect you to these engineers. Bye thank bye. you. Bye bye. See you in Haiti. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Paul. So speaking of people and technology, we at Dassault Systems are on a mission to inspire many more women to become the next generation engineers and innovators. Today, as part of our Women in Engineering initiative, we are unveiling a painting done by our very own Mark Alger, a SolidWorks user, celebrating the work done by these six powerful women in STEM and engineering fields. Betty Baker, Kate Reed, Jade Crompton, Megan Zimba, Melissa Ahmed, and Daniel Boyer. I know all of them are listening to us, so let's give them a big, big round of applause. And we are lucky today, Kate, is, Kate Reed is present here with us today. Hi. Hey, Kate, welcome. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. <laughs> so Kate, tell us what your journey has been as an engineer or maker. Yeah, so I was so fortunate to be exposed to making and robotics at such a young age. And that really just set me on this path towards building my own future and building my way into the future. And so now I work with nature to actually grow my way into the future and grow new interfaces. Well, I mean, you know, we are watching and we, we, we understand what you mean by growing interfaces and growing um, into that. And I see you in the Fab Lab here doing a lot of work. Now, do you have any words for the budding, as aspiring young women engineers? Of course. I would say to fail fast and never give up. Well, so as you guys heard, you know, fail fast and never give up, so short and sweet. Thank you, Kate, Thanks. for a quick presence. Thank Thanks. You. And good luck. Our passionate community and 3D experience platform technology provides an amazing force for doing good. Makers for Good Makeaton is an innovation marathon focusing on creating a sustainable future. This Makeaton at 3D Experience World 2022 was open for participation for both professionals and students. And the winners are Water cleaning robot from Team Momentum, Egypt. <laughs> Sustainable farming from Team Growy, Mexico. 3D printed molds for molded fiber industry, Team Biomold from USA. Well, I love this audience uh, cheering all in the background. Huh? and early breast cancer detection machine with artificial intelligence from Team Thermi, Mexico. Congratulations to all the winners. For the past few years, we have also been working with Michael Mendoza and Ellen Ford Foundation in order to help them provide free mechanical prosthetic hands for all who need them anywhere in the world. Last year, the team designed the next generation prosthetic hand for them. This year, we want to enroll any students through the Arm for All design contest. Let's hear from Jason Pohl and Michael Mendoza about the competition. Hi, students and educators. We're launching the design contest starting February 9th to May 9th. I'm here with Michael, the founder of Ellen 4 Prosthetic Hand Foundation. We've distributed over 60,000 hands in 80 countries in the last 16 years. But did you know there are over 13 million people in the world who are missing at least a portion of their arm? We're looking for some talented young people to help us improve upon how we attach our prosthetic hand to a recipient's arm. Now's your chance to be a part of changing people's lives. During the project, all students will be offered a free 3D Experience SolidWorks license. Get started today at solidworks.com slash arm for all. So all your students, do not forget to register for the competition and help make a change. 
There is a large part of our community occupied with empowering our student and young workforce to create this future of everything. Over 15 million students from high schools, community colleges, and universities across the world have used 3D Experience Works, including SolidWorks, both inside and outside the classrooms. In November last year, more than 70 schools and more than 8,000 very young students in Turkey used apps for kids as their first 3D design lesson working with our local partner, Takias. Akruti, an annual nation nationwide design contest in India, provides unique opportunity for engineering students to shape and share their imaginations and innovations in 3D. Dassault system teams, we use 3D experience platform to run Akruti. 389 colleges and over 3,800 students participated from all across India in 2021. You know, the next step, another step in empowering this workforce of the future is creating skill-based training. 3D Experience Works and SolidWorks certification has become the proof of competency in the industry. We have now over 600,000 certified users across the world. Just over 95,000 certifications were earned in 2021 alone, including a record-breaking 9,000 certification on 3D experience platform roles. I'd like to extend a big, thing, big thanks to the certification team led by Mike Puckett, and also give a big, big applause to our certified users. So as you've seen, our user community is a driving force in future of everything. They innovate every day and continue to be the catalyst in their local communities across the world. Now, let me invite user community manager Dan Wagner on to speak more about this. Hey, Suchit. Hey, Dan, how are you? Good, good, thanks for having me. Well, the SolidWorks user group, the, the Swagin Network, and the SolidWorks Champion programs are two of the most imp important pillars of our community. Sure. Tell us, tell us more about them. Yeah, last year, uh, the SolidWorks User Group Network grew to 235 groups with 20,000 members across the, across the globe, which is pretty crazy. We onboarded 60 new groups in 19 countries. The SolidWorks Champions program, under the leadership of, of Sean O'Neill, grew to over 500, and actually now it's 600 as of, as of this day, uh, in 53 countries, which again is just, is just amazing. Well, that, that is some amazing growth uh, of our community. Now, I know that one of the traditions, uh, Dan, of 3D Experience World yep. is to deliver the Swagin Choice Awards at the annual Swagin uh, Summit. Yeah, for so, sure. How did that go? Yeah, the summit was a blast. It was a good time. This was Monday night. The summit is a chance for us to gather all of the group leaders and group members, anybody who's attending the conference. We kind of recap the previous year, talk about what happened in 2021, and we give out some awards. You can see these awards here, actually, these five awards. And I'm happy to say we reserve two very special awards for today. Is that okay if we do that right now? Of course, absolutely. Go ahead. Awesome. These two awards are special. They're named after two very important people who really helped make Swagin what it is today. So firstly here, the uh, Michelle Pillars Community Award for 2021 goes to Eric Beatty of the Seattle area SolidWorks Power User Group. Eric's an awesome guy, awesome group leader. And second here, the Wayne Tiffany User Group Leader of the Year Award for 2021 goes to Theodore Chartatsis of the Hellenic Swag in, Atlanta, in uh, Athens, Greece. Awesome. Uh, Suchit, thanks. It, this was awesome to be able to recognize these folks in front of the entire conference. I really appreciate it. Well, Dan, thank you, and you're always welcome on this stage. All right, thanks. Thank you. So as I said a moment ago, the user community is a driving force. These programs and these users are truly ensuring the future and development of our community. 
So whether it is about the future machines of the year 2100 or future of just about everything, one thing is certain, this community, you, and the so systems with 3D Experience Works will be a part of creating it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Suchit. Thank you, what Tracy. an engaging yeah. community, always so inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Well, it is time to say a big thank you to HP for their support of the event. After decades of relentless innovation, we've entered a new era of high-performance technology, the era of Z. We're equipping you to evolve, to change for the better, faster. We deliver transformative power so you can advance in AI and 3D, reimagine collaboration, render in real time, and make magic happen behind the scenes with Z Central, a remote collaboration software that just won us an engineering Emmy. How do we do it? with a rich portfolio of IP and patents that shatters industry standards again and again. An unwavering commitment to sustainability and security. And by teaming up with NVIDIA to deliver the high compute power you need to propel your next breakthrough, we are redefining the future of design. This is Z by HP. Thank you, HP. We've heard about most of the parts of the 3D Experience Works portfolio over the last two days. As Minish shared, simulation is an important step in the product development process. Here to share how GE Healthcare is using the advanced simulation products to ensure the accuracy of their designs is Simulia R&D Roles Portfolio Director, Delphine Genouvrier. Good morning and welcome to the simulation session of 3D Experience World event. I'm very happy to be with you today and with Dr. Joseph Lacey and Jura Kanu Danashesian for GLS Care. Hello, thanks for joining us. Morning. Morning. Thank you for having us. Together, we will go through your experience on using the 3D Experience Work simulation solution during your product development process. But before, uh, I'd like to go through a brief overview of GE Healthcare Company. Wow, such an inspiring video. Uh, Dr. Lacey uh, and Mr. Dana Shazian, could you please tell us what you're doing at GE Healthcare? So I'm a uh, principal mechanical engineer. I've been with GE Healthcare about 21 years. Uh, originally worked in CT detectors, now working in the anesthesia and respiratory group. Uh, I pretty much only work on new product development research and development type projects. I do a little install based stuff, but not a lot. And you, Didi, what, what do you do at GS Care? Yes, I am a lead mechanical engineer. I am extension, extension of Dr. Lazy. My full-time job is to run simulation, understanding the loading in structural, fluid dynamics, heat transfer, electromagnetics, and design optimization. So as I mentioned, I am Dr. Lazy's extension. In addition to that, I, I am a, one of the product production associate to make ventilators when there is a critical need. Plus, one of the user group leader for SolidWorks user group forum focusing on simulation. 
Um, in your corporate video, some key themes grab my attention, such as readability, performance, quality, cutting edge technologies. So I'd like to ask you, Dr. Lacey, why do you use simulation in your department? Well, one of the things I, a term I use a lot is deterministic design. And one of the things, medical equipment, you know, has to be hyper reliable. That's a given. To do good relay work, you have to have a good design to start with, right? So the simulation, the way I use it and use it with my team is to drive the product design, not to analyze it after the fact, right? We do do some of that, but we focus on trying to map design space, for instance, <clears throat> in FEA or CFD. Uh, current project that Didi and I are working on, uh, new vaporizer design. That's all been done with CFD. Didi, uh, can you please go through some of the key applications uh, that you've been running with the 3D Response Works uh, solution with us? Sure. So, in our department, we are saving lives in moments that matter, and we are building the world which works for us. That's the goal of our company. So, like Dr. Lacey mentioned, we want to have a powerful solutions to solve our complex problem. So some of the examples we would like to share with our community. So one is the flex seal design, another is the wearing compression, and then we have several problems like sensor technology to be used. So let's go one by one. So first thing we study is a quick overview of how the mechanism works. So we have snap fits, snap fits, elastomer, hyperelastic material, along with material models like, so Mooney Revlin, um, so many material models we are using it. And then one of the complex system we are analyzing is the seal within the model. So we wanted to achieve the contact pressure and the sealing forces within the system. So we started with 3D experience platform, which has a strong associative within SOLIDWORKS designs. So we bring it in and model mesh everything within 3D experience structural platform. And we use hybrid mesh technology, which is very powerful to capture all the details and the incompressibility of the material to achieve the convergence. So as you see it from here, we use hex mesh for the seal and rest of the material model is tetrahedron with the linear and parabolic material models. Yeah, one small point, we had looked, we had tried to solve this problem with other codes. And I won't mention names, but we, we couldn't even get close. Um, once we switched over to this tool, it, it, I was very impressed with how fast and easy this problem solved. Exactly. So sequential loading or multi-step loading is cakewalk for us within the 3D experience platform. So we study the mechanism, apply it, as a sequence within the 3D experience platform. Like in this example, we are applying a pre-bolt load with the torque and then apply the bolt restraints and then the real load of prescribed displacement for the full compression of almost 11 millimeter travel. Most of the solvers in other groups failed, but we were able to achieve it using 3D experience platform because of so many things like generalized contact, which is, very important for our team. Like Dr. Lazy will be waiting for simulation to present to the design review. We need to solve quickly. So without setting any upfront contact sets, we are able to use generalized contact to solve the model very quickly in addition to hybrid meshing. And then every team members during the design review wants to see how the system works. We are able to show in our team design reviews, this compression of the seal to the full 11.5 millimeters in this scenario. And then we were able to give contact pressure, contact forces yeah. in those critical area, which enabled them to make, whether to go with the harder elastomer like EPDM or to go with the softer elastomers, elastomers like silicon. And most of the time, team members want to see the design review, especially the outputs coming from simulation using 3D experience platform, like stiffness of the material, stress of the material and whole deformation, we were able to show it to our team. Yeah, and one of the, you know, the, I brought, I mentioned this earlier, but, you know, looking at the bolt pattern, like designing the bolt pattern and designing the order which you tighten them, we're actually looking at manufacturability as part of the design simulation. 
Um, that is, that's the way we try to use the tools here. That's a great application. And indeed, you know, this is a, this is a pretty difficult type of, of simulation. <coughs> you have the nonlinear contact, you have the nonlinear type of material. And this is, this is amazing to see how you've taken you know, all the value of the three experience uh, work simulation solution to, uh, to simulate that type of, of flex seal uh, design. What is important, as you mentioned, is that, you know, to be able to communicate as well how a product is going to be deformed, you know, is as well leveraging the simulation result as really uh, technical insight for more people than just few yeah. user of simulation. I mean, as you can imagine, there's an infinite number of geometries one could pick, right? Picking blindly or just picking on your gut, sometimes that works, but usually the best you'll get is a suboptimal solution, if you're lucky. Very nice application. Let's see a second one, if you agree. Yeah, second one is a lot of times in our agent delivery process, like Dr. Lizzie mentioned, we have to deliver vaporizer to the patients in ICU. So during this delivery, we have a lot of parts and a lot of worries come in contact with the agent. So our team wants to ensure that perfect ceiling in the design. So we started using 3D experience, structural performance engineer to achieve the goal. So to start with, before we were having this tool, we use SOLIDWORKS simulation as a starting point. Try to solve it. We hit up some walls, immediately switch to SOLIDWORKS 3D experience platform, which made us to solve very quickly. So as you see it from here, this is part of the vaporization chamber. We have a top block or cap and the wooring and the chamber. So we simulated the entire thing using 3D experience platform within a few hours using hybrid machine technology, generalized contact, and advanced material models like hyperelastics using the material calibration app within the program. Yeah. And this is a case where you use, you know, like this type of simulation to work through your tolerance stack and say, you know, over the range of tolerances I could get, how does my O-ring perform? You know, what's my lower bounds on compression? What's my upper bounds on compression? And we were able to make design changes like three-piece design into single piece. And then we had O-rings at in the sub-assembly, top, middle, and bottom. We optimized to single piece design with top and bottom O-ring only using simulation. Awesome, awesome application. And you mentioned, Dr. Lacey, uh, that you're using the, the material room calibration as well, you know, as a, as yeah. a new way uh, to make the link between the real and, and the virtual. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Um, I mean, that's an unbelievably valuable tool, right? Because especially for nonlinear problems like this, right? You live and die by your constitutive equations and, and your material knowledge. And so that tool really helps you tune to get a good fit to the right constitutive equation. And the other thing that we just implemented, we just purchased a DMA uh, tester so that we can mm -hmm. get our own material properties. Cause it's also very hard. You can call the manufacturer of the seal and what you can actually learn from them is fairly limited. Um, Thanks a lot, Didi. These are really nice uh, example of uh, how you've been able to leverage the, the power of the Simulia application for, uh, for for your companies. And I'm sure that it resonates very well to the studio community because now everybody has, you know, the power of such very advanced simulation for their own product development process. This is this is amazing. Um, Absolutely, Delphine. And we are able to achieve very strong goals like simulation-driven design yeah. using simulation. Which, which is music to my ear. <laughs> <laughs> we are able to achieve the accuracy for complex nonlinear models using 3D experience structural performance engineering program. Right, and that, that, that's really, you know, our, our mission. And what, what is important, as you mentioned as well, is a workflow that we've developed, you know, uh, so it's a smooth workflow from SOLIDWORKS to the 3D experience simulation. So you can do those what-if scenario, the design changes that you mentioned, because indeed we don't do simulation for the sake of doing simulation, we do engineering, you know, as, as you mentioned, Dr. Lacey. And I think this is, this is very important. And we are able to share these results with our global partners who are in Ushi in China, Bangalore in India. Yeah. Awesome. Collaboration this time, you know, important. <laughs> 
Uh, to conclude, I'd like to, uh, to ask you uh, how and where do you see the future of simulation at G Healthcare? We're driving, like this project that we're on right now that I'm leading, we're driving it predominantly through simulation. Um, some of it is experimental um, and I'm not, in fact, I'm trained as an experimentalist, so I'm certainly not anti-experiment. Um, <clears throat> but being able to map the design space, so I see that getting pushed further into programs, right? That's a natural evolution. That's something that, you know, in other places in GE, that's the norm. Um, but where I came from, that was the norm. So that, that to me is just evolution. Where I see us going long-term is getting more people trained, as I said, not necessarily in using the tool, but understanding what the tool can do. Um, and then pushing some of that, because right, there's always been a push, like how do we get designers using the tools, right? Um, there are certain problems, like both the joint problems, where you could make that fairly straightforward recipe kind of driven, where a designer could be making more judicious choices up front in their design. Right? I think I'm gonna we're gonna start working towards that as a goal. And then, big picture, for I think where you guys are going with the cloud makes infinite sense. It's not a question of that's where it's gonna go. It's a question how fast and you know, what hurdles uh, pop up that, it, that have to be overcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for your inspiring feedback, for your great testimonial. It's always a pleasure to, uh, to speak with you. I uh, hope that next time, you know, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll be able to chat face-to-face. Uh, -face. Yeah, uh, thank nice. you so much. And thank you, uh, Didi, as well. Um, it's now time to close our simulation session. Uh, thank you uh, for uh, your participation. Thanks for uh, all the audience in joining us and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thanks for thank having you. us. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. And thank you, Delphine and GE. It's critical to understand how your products will perform before they head to manufacturing. And speaking of manufacturing, we've all heard about some of the challenges the industry is facing. From global competition to a growing skills gap is the aging workforce retires. 3D Experience Works partner sales manager Mike Bookley brings together Megan Ziemba, host of Mavens of Manufacturing, Scott Harms and Scott Volk of MetalQuest Unlimited, and Jeff Holfelt from Northern Industrial Manufacturing to discuss the knowledge and know-how needed to address these challenges. Over to you, Mike. Hey, thanks, Tracy. We appreciate uh, checking in today. So that is correct. We do have four experts here. So let's start with Megan. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what you do? Yeah, so I'm a tech writer by trade, and I uh, help manufacturers across different disciplines in the sector uh, generate some of their content, including white papers, blog posts, social media stuff. And then what I really have a passion for is the podcast that I started almost two years ago called Mavens of Manufacturing. And it highlights all of the amazing women within the sector from the shop floor all the way up to the C-suite. And they get a chance to talk about everything that they're doing and some of the standards that they're setting for modern day manufacturing. Yeah, and if, no, if anybody hasn't checked it out, you really should because it is amazing to go listen to all these people talk about the challenges and, and where they're at and where manufacturing is going. So Jeff, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what you do. Yeah, so I'm Jeff Hofelt, the Vice President of Northern Industrial Manufacturing. We're a tier one automotive supplier out of the Michigan, Detroit area. And I'm the Vice President where I head operations, sales, purchasing, et cetera. And really happy to be here and happy to be called an expert probably for the first time in my life. Yeah. Everyone on this panel is experts, trust me. Um, the, so we're gonna go to Scott Harms next. Scott, can you tell us a little bit about what you do? Yeah, I'm Scott Harms with MetalQuest Unlimited. Um, we're a very high technology based uh, job shop. Um, you know, we don't like to be called a machine shop because we really do encompass pretty much the entire scope of uh, custom manufacturing centered around machining. We have facilities in Nebraska and Idaho, and uh, I guess we're proud to be on the panel. The last person is also Scott. Scott Volk, can you tell us what you do? Yeah, good morning. Um, my name is Scott Volk. I'm the Vice President and Chief Operating Officer at MetalQuest. Um, 27 years of manufacturing experience, so one of the older people on the panel here today. Um, but yeah, just like Scott said, we're a high-tech manufacturer. Uh, 
try to be leading edge on a lot of automation, a lot of creative things in manufacturing, and I really enjoy my job, enjoy talking about what we're doing and how we can make manufacturing more exciting for everybody. Yeah, and you know that's what we're actually going to lead off with here is uh, the first question will be for Scott Harms and Megan. Megan, I'd like for you to start, but we're going to ask the question I think that a lot of people talk about these days. And you know, if you open up any article, everyone's always talking about skills gap, workforce, unemployment. It seems like everybody's talking about it. What can we do to actually get more people into the field and get more people to be part of? manufacturing and in the high tech space that we have? Uh, manufacturers need to shift their marketing efforts, not just to focus on potential customers, but also to focus on the potential next generation workforce. And what I mean by that, they need to be a little bit more proactive and really put themselves out there, uh, get comfortable with the uncomfortable and maybe do some things that they never thought about doing or have done before in terms of connecting with their community and getting in front of students from middle school all the way up to high school, maybe even elementary school. Uh, there's a lot of organizations out there that they can provide sponsorship to or donate to in terms of materials and equipment. Uh, one such organization, we all know FIRST Robotics. Um, that's a great opportunity for manufacturers to either sponsor a robotics team or actually start one and then uh, develop some sort of mentorship program as they're designing the robots and providing them guidance and really showing them, you know, hey, this is what we do as a company and this is how it fits in with what you're doing with FIRST and then guiding them through that process and actually showing them what a modern day career pathway in manufacturing and engineering looks like. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with that. Uh, Scott, before I add my comments, I would like for you to, to talk from your side and give your explanation of how you think that we can do better. Well, that's an excellent question. And, you know, a lot of this goes to an image, you know, and, and just an identity type thing. You know, manufacturing for so many years is has been kind of a derogatory occupation and a derogatory field. And it's just it's just tragic. You know, a lot of people don't understand the massive technology that's in manufacturing today. I mean, we have to be product experts and specialists in what we do. You have to combine a lot of mechanical type characteristics and, and mechanical elements uh, with very high technology and computer elements as well. I mean, it, it's truly a tech based occupation, but it's, it's not marketed as that. So, you know, probably about 10 years ago in that vicinity, you know, our company really started to, to make a push to kind of show the excitement in manufacturing, to show that, you know, it, it's not the way you, you may remember it, you know, from 40 years ago or, or something like that, um, you know, using social media and, and just reaching out to the general public and showing the positive elements. You know, we're going to have to do stuff like that to make it appear to be a very desirable occupation to be in because, yes, the skills gap is real. You know, um, high schools, you know, many years ago took a lot of the VOTEC programs out of their, their school systems. Fortunately, there's a movement to try and get them put back right now. But, you know, that's really left the, the country very short on things that are, are very mission critical to our lives um, as we know them, because we know manufacturing is very broad based, but it is so critically important uh, to provide us with the things that we use and rely on every day. Yeah, I, I could agree more with both of what you said, because I think the, the challenge is people want to spend money that are in manufacturing. They want it to be better, but it's not always just throwing money at the problem. It's really opening up a discussion, having better communication and bring people in to sh see the manufacturing facility, because traditionally, you know, the manufacturing was always nah, we don't we don't want people in here. We don't want them to see the secret sauce of what we do. But that really hurts our image and what we do for manufacturing. You know, it, the more people see, the more comfortable they are, the better we can be. So with that. We're going to switch to the other side, which would be Jeff and Scott. And what we're going to talk about is supply chain management, the cost of goods and inflation. So we all hear that there's a shortage, right? So we, we all hear that prices are going up, but we're still expected to manufacture at the same price that we were three years ago. So we'll start with Jeff and then we'll go to Scott Volk. Um, can you guys talk a little bit about how we're addressing those challenges? Yeah, um, thanks for that. So we're we're really having a hard time addressing. I mean, to be honest, they say that inflation, especially uh, the values, the farmers, because they're able to get a lot more pricing for for their goods as the inflation goes up. 
But for us manufacturers, a lot of us are locked into longer term contracts. We have contracts that are looking at being extended through 2026, 2028. And so some of the things that that we've been trying to do and been relatively successful at in in the near the in the shorter term is trying to bring up that dialogue with our with our customers and putting some form of inflationary impact adjustments throughout the the life cycle of the program. And so it's really been a challenge. I mean, if if inflation stays at two two point five three percent, at least you can somewhat try to manage. But when you start seeing numbers that are eight nine, you know, record inflation, uh, it really starts to impact suppliers' bottom lines. Yeah, and, and those are the uncontrollable costs, right? Those are the things that we just have to deal with. So, Scott, can you can you add a little bit to that as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, like Jeff, uh, this is a bigger challenge than I think I've ever seen in my life. And um, there's not a lot of really good solutions right now. Um, honestly, as crazy as it sounds, the biggest thing is, is a key to this that we're getting through is communication. I mean, we're in constant communication with our customers. We're in constant communication with our, with our suppliers and also constant communication with our employees. Because it's really easy for us like, well, I ran out of material for my machine. Well, it's somebody in purchasing's fault. Well, it's not. It's, you know, there's there's a lot bigger problems at play here. Um, things we have done, you know, like Jeff said, the pricing pressures are tremendous where it's really hard for us to get price increases on stuff. And, you know, when when, when, we, when we can, then they don't want to just turn around and have another price increase. So what one thing that we've been really successful with is going to a quarterly pricing structure with one of our larger customers, which has been really nice. And then coupled with that, we have a pretty sophisticated surcharge system. So one of the most cyclical prices, as Jeff can attest, is your material cost. So we're able to track that separately from all of our other costs and actually give positive and negative surcharges to our customers as those prices fluctuate. And that makes it a little easier to get price increases passed because the customer is going to know that there's a little more stability with the other input costs with the most flexibility being in that in that uh, material cost. So it's just a lot of little things like that trying to get by, but it, until we can get more people into this industry and doing more stuff, I mean, we're in for, I'm afraid, a couple more years of, of pain and headache here where we're trying to fight through this because we just don't have the people to get the product out the door and we're all in the same boat. And we see the same thing you know, even on the transportation side. Um, we're getting materials overseas, which technically should have a quicker lead time. And the mill actually is delivering at a quicker lead time, but then it gets stuck in a port. And we're at the same lead time we were if we would have went a different route. So it just seems like, like we can't win right now. Yeah, it, I mean, the one thing that has been common between all four of your answers is we really need to be better at communicating. We need to be better at explaining these things together. And unfortunately, you know, we're not always the best at explaining and manufacturing and educating. So I guess my question is, I'll, I'll wrap all this together and I would like all four of you to respond. Um, and then I'll add my thoughts last. But the, the bigger question is, is so we know we need people. We know that manufacturing is changing. We know we need to be more open. Uh, I've heard, you know, Scott and Jeff talk about the need for data analytics, the need for understanding everything in, in a real-time process. So how do we get the right people and how do we communicate effectively to get those people in? Um, Megan, do you want to start again? And then I'll let you know the, the rest of you jump in, but Megan, can you lead that off? Because I think we're all sort of talking about the same problem. Yeah, so we really have to start a lot earlier than I think what some are expecting to do. A lot of people are talking about high school and uh, middle school, but it, the, the root of the problem actually goes a lot back a lot farther to the elementary school level. So we have to start exposing kids a lot sooner to what manufacturing and engineering is. Of course, they're not thinking about careers that young, but if there's activities or things that we can bring into the curriculum that helps develop those soft skills that are needed for some of these um, opportunities that are available, that's a great, a great starting point. And then as they're getting through their school, um, going through elementary school, going through middle school, going through high school, just keep building up on those different activities and then slowly but surely bringing in the conversation about career pathways. 
Um, I think, again, it's investing some of those marketing dollars that you would put towards your potential customers and actually investing it to actually market to your community as well. Have open houses, have um, facility tours, um, sign up for virtual opportunities. Uh, uh, if there was one benefit of COVID, it was uh, showing us that we can communicate on a virtual platform. And there's a lot of tools out there. One that I use is StreamYard. Um, that people can use to have conversations like we're having right now on a live basis. So, you know, volunteering your time and having a virtual meet with a high school to teach what you do at your facility. I know high school teachers that have told me personally that they would love an opportunity to do that. So just being proactive, putting yourself out there, having conversations, not just with students, but their parents as well. Because I think parents are still kind of weary of what manufacturing is, and they're not aware of what opportunities are available to them because things are advancing so fastly, so quickly. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Scott Volk, I'll, I'll let you jump in next. Yeah, absolutely. So just building off what Megan said, I can't agree more. I mean, and the I think the the key thing to take away from that is it's the long game. Everybody needs to understand that this is a long game approach. We are not going to fix this overnight. And everyone also needs to understand that it takes all of us to do this. If you expect the schools to just figure this out on your own, you're wrong. The industry has to get engaged with the schools. Like Megan said, down to like the fifth and sixth grade level, we actually have had young like first and second graders come in and get tours of our robots because they think it's super cool. Well, you're planting those seeds. You know, and it's you just have to start working at that long game and building it out. There's obviously things we need to do in the short term to try to keep things going, but we really need to put our attention on the long game and understand that it's going to be painful for a while. But if we don't do that, we're never going to get out of this mess. Yeah, and, and things like robots are are always important, right? Because you, it doesn't matter what they do; they're just cool. So, Jeff, can you jump in and add your thoughts? Yeah, so similar to, to what the others said, I, I think we got to have outside of the box solutions and not always trying to do the same thing that you might have tried to do a year ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Some of the things that we're doing, I'm chairman of the board of uh, the local economic development corporation. And one of the things we've done is try to open up our area to maybe different types of communities. So we petitioned very successfully we got a bus a bus route added uh, to our our area that allows buses to come in from different communities. And we're doing a job fair here in about uh, 60 days where we're partnering with the community colleges, where we're partnering with the local high schools. Uh, it'll be the the first time we've really done that. And so it's trying to open up these different communities. and a lot of a lot of what Megan was saying, you know, trying to get women and these underserved communities, into the STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and math. And that really does start at, at a younger age. I mean, I was, I was fortunate. My, my father was an engineer. My grandfather was an engineer. Um, it was ingrained in me that, hey, manufacturing isn't a dirty business. It's very rewarding, but not everybody comes up with that same upbringing. And so, um, you know, I think to what, what Megan's trying to do is really get in, in the, in the schools, in the classrooms, and have have that impact on the on the local level, and then just start affecting people that way. Yeah, it, it definitely takes all of us to make this work, right? And Scott Harms, can you talk a little bit about you know some of the things that that you guys have done? Absolutely. You know, there's been some great points on here, and um, you know, just ch changing the directions a little bit. You know, as manufacturers, one of the tasks that it seems like we're always giving is, given is doing more with less. Um, you know, it's like as manufacturers, we're always expected to be more efficient. We're always expected, you know, to, to keep costs under control, you know, to increase our volume, et cetera. We're in unprecedented times right now because of the nationwide labor shortage. And we have to take doing more with less to the absolute next level. So what we're doing as a company, and we've been doing this for a while, uh, going back to 15 years, um, you know, we talked about robots a little bit. Robots are, are more than just the concept of it. it. It's part of an automation solution. You know, robots used to be thought of as taking people's jobs. Well, those jobs don't exist anymore. They're not taking people's jobs. So as a company, you know, we really worked hard to be dynamic and, and essentially make sure that we're always on the leading edge of providing the, the services we need to our customers. You know, again, with that labor shortage component in mind. 
So we're really advertising, um, you know, for more uh, people that are capable of understanding electromechanical aspects, understanding how to build an automation cell, you know, and concepts that, that truly increase our throughput, especially working towards, um, you know, essentially low volume, high mix type parts, which are very difficult to automate. But we've got to be very strong in doing that if you want to be competitive. Uh, going forward. And many companies like this are, because to be honest with you right now, we're kind of at a breaking point. If you don't start adapting your ways and you don't, you know, we've talked about inflation, we've talked about labor shortages, you know, we've talked about, uh, you know, supplier issues as far as uh, short raw material shortages, you have to be the most dynamic you possibly can be right now. And it's really changed our thought process dramatically and just forced you to think outside the box. Yeah, and, and I think you all bring up a really good point because there's we have this challenge that's out, affecting everyone from the outside, right? And we have to deal with it. But the, the other component of it is, is the jobs that we have today and the jobs that most people know are not the jobs of tomorrow, right? So how do we get education? How do we get people excited about manufacturing for jobs that are completely different than what their parents and grandparents and everyone else knew? And I, I think it it all comes back again to you have to have the right systems in place from a technological component, right? You have to have the right message going out to everyone, not just a specific group. And then I think the, the last component is we all have to be better at communicating, you know, and, and if we can do all that together outside of all competing for the same jobs, I think we'll be in a position that, you know, people want to start coming in and the value of, you know, being remote, being connected, having a platform to work with is I can now be in a rural area and I can go get the best talent to support my factory. And they may not even have to move. You know, I think that that is really one of the benefits that's come out of a lot of this technology in the last few years is I can program my robots, have it up on a platform and have my operator come back on the other side, working in the facility to be able to run the programs and ensure it fits. So, you know, it, it's scary because we're short on employees, but if we think different, we have the ability now to capture the best talent anywhere on the planet. Um, with that, I wish we could talk longer. Um, we're just about at the end of our time. So if, if anyone wants to learn more, uh, please reach out to, to the folks that are here, you know, ping them later on. Um, but we can't thank you enough for being with us today. Uh, I look forward to chatting in the future with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. And thank you so much, Mike and panelists, for that really important discussion. A lot of really wonderful thoughts and ideas. Well, now a word from our final sponsor, Lenovo. Thank you to Lenovo and all of our sponsors for helping to make this event possible. Mark and Michael, we are live. Are you ready to show us your 2023 skits? Uh, yeah, Tracy, uh, you know what? Just give us a moment to set up our equipment. Hey, weren't you on our flight? Ah, never mind. All right, Mark, let's see. We've got camera, lights, check and check. Sound, check. <laughs> Sound check. I see what you did there. Come on, Michael, we talked about this. Focus. Oh, right, focus. Focus, check. All right, you have the box? Box, what box? Dude, you said you were doing an unboxing. Oh, calm down. That's just a figure of speech. We don't use actual boxes anymore. Just roll camera and I'll show you. The big brains at SolidWorks R&D have done it again. 
they pumped even more performance and amazing enhancements into this annual release. The first thing to notice is, of course, SOLIDWORKS 2023 supports Windows 11. Okay, so let's dive in. I'll start by opening my large assembly in lightweight mode. But wait, where is it? Oh, so this must be the Resolve on Demand mode. This new enhancement combines resolved and lightweight modes together, making assemblies load super fast. When I last opened this assembly, it took 38 seconds. But with Resolve on Demand mode, it only takes 20, which is a massive improvement. When I want to dig into the structure of the assembly, it still loads quickly, just like in Resolve mode. I need to export a step of this assembly. Oh nice, in 2023, SOLIDWORKS can automatically create a special type of step file for each component, and these are all linked to each other. I didn't even know step could do that. I'm going to use the open drawing command to quickly get to the associated drawing. Yeah, so I like this. They've made it so that the components set to transparent, like these glass windows, actually look transparent when I choose hidden lines visible and hidden lines removed. This will make it really clear when I share this drawing. The bomb looks good too, but I'm noticing this blue text. What is that all about? Ah, it's manually overwritten data. In SOLIDWORKS 2023, it's easy to see what's manually overwritten without having to check each cell of the bomb. It's easy to restore the original value in this cell, or all cells, with a simple right click. I want to rearrange these columns, but what are these arrows? Oh, now that's really cool. SOLIDWORKS 2023 lets me filter the bomb however I want to. That's huge. So here I'm creating a bomb for purchase parts and non-purchase parts. You know, these are some great enhancements. Resolve on demand, step export options, and improvements to drawings. But they're really just scratching the surface. I wish I didn't have to wait until November for SOLIDWORKS 2023, because I really don't want to have to put these enhancements back in the box. And cut. All right, nice job, Mark. Thanks, Michael. You know, that was really fun making a video rather than just watching. Yeah, really nice work. All right, yeah, and I, I gotta say, way to think outside of the box. Yeah, good job, buddy. <laughs> All right, my turn. Man, it's hot up here under these lights. Oh, but check this out. I designed a water-cooled jacket. I saw this on a video where they water-cool everything. So I designed my own water-cooled jacket. A water-cooled jacket? Yeah, and speaking of heat transfer, let me transfer over to our sponsor, the SOLIDWORKS User Group Network. Find a group near you today or become a leader yourself and get connected. I hear they have some pretty neat swag too. Swaggin.org. So head on over to swaggin.org today. All right, back to this jacket. So this intake hose provides a steady stream of lightly chilled spring water, which keeps my core at an optimal temperature all day long. Non-believer, well, let me show you with SOLIDWORKS 2023. The initial design of the jacket is looking good, but we have to make room for the elbows. Editing the pattern, I can use instances to skip to easily remove the tubes of interest. And for your jacket mark, we need to make the arms a little bit longer. So let's create a new configuration and modify the pattern. We've been able to configure the number of instances and spacing before, and now, with SOLIDWORKS 2023, we can configure the instances to skip as well. Simply modify the instances as desired. Creating and configuring increasingly complex products just got easier. Take a look at that. Long sleeves for you, and regular sleeves for me. But what would this cool jacket be without some extravagant branding? This label assembly will do the trick, but we need some rivet holes to attach it to the jacket. An extruded cut at the top level assembly will make quick work of this. SOLIDWORKS 2023 expands the direction options to match that of part extrude features. In this case, the extrude cut goes through the label and up to the inside face of the sleeve. And of course, we can pattern and mirror this expanded feature. To finish up the design of our custom label, we'll use the stick line font and the enhanced wrap feature to scribe the text onto the non-planar face. This generates the CNC toolpaths directly in CAD to make downstream operations more efficient. Whether you're showing the paths in a drawing or using them in your CAM tool, such as our NC prismatic and turning programmer role on the 3D Experience platform. 
Wow, great job, Michael. These 2023 enhancements look great, but I think I'll stick to traditional water cooling. Yeah, good idea, especially with this last batch of enhancements. They are way too hot to show on stage, even with the most advanced water cooling technology. Good thing we have our stunt doubles standing by. You ready, guys? <laughs> My tongue fall off. Uh, still a task, Mark. <laughs> Looking good. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in. And for First We Sketch, I'm your host, Al Denozer, and you're watching Hot Za. It's a show about hot cad and even hotter week old swuggin' leftover pizza. And today, I'm joined by special guest, Mark Isometric. Mark is known for his role as the police officer in Working From Home Alone. He's also known for his excessive use of over 60 esky items on his esky bar. It's actually 72 now. I've added flex and dome. Ooh, impressive. Hey, Mark, thanks for being here on the show and taking time away from that quad 4K display setup and that fresh installation of SolidWorks 2023. Yeah, I really didn't want to be here, but it seems like you guys really need my help. Okay, let's dive into our first sauce here. This one's called Circular References, and it measures about 1.6 million units on the Scoville scale. Dizziness, hair loss, blindness, hallucinations. Is this safe? I don't know, but that's what our legal team's for. Yeah, get a good amount on there. <laughs> so Mark, you've been using SolidWorks since the days that computers were run on kerosene and started with hand cranks. Let me ask you, what do you think are some of the most influential features in SolidWorks? <coughs> Thinking back over the years, I'd have to say the sheet metal functionality in SolidWorks has really helped how I approach my designs, such as this custom hot sauce rack. Sensors have been around for a while and allow you to monitor critical data in your CAD model, such as dimensions, mass properties, simulation results, and more. With SOLIDWORKS 2023, users can now create sensors that monitor sheet metal properties. In this design, I've set an alarm to be triggered if the dimension of the flat pattern exceeds past the stock material. In this case, the edge flam will cause problems with the sourced material blanks. A quick edit to the edge flange length helps confirm no surprises in downstream manufacturing. 2023 also introduces a new default custom property. Gauge values can now be directly associated to your parts custom properties. This ensures accuracy in notes, bend tables, bill of materials, and more. These new enhancements in SOLIDWORKS sheet metal are sure to excite any flat pattern enthusiast. To verify my material and gauge selection is strong enough to hold your nuclear-fueled hot sauces, I'll turn to SOLIDWORKS Simulation. SOLIDWORKS Simulation 2023 extends pre-processing tools with the new Stability Analyzer to help validate the setup of your study. This gives you deeper insight into unconstrained and improperly connected bodies that can keep the study from solving. For example, running the analyzer with a scale factor set to high we identify the low stiffness behavior of the model, which validates our assumptions. Changing the scale factor filters out the expected behavior to confirm that our model is ready to run. Simulation 2023 also introduces user control over the penalty stiffness for contacts. This helps reach an approximate solution faster during early design iterations. SOLIDWORKS Simulation 2023 gives users more control to get the right results faster. All right, Mark, we can't thank you enough for coming on and showing us some of the new enhancements in SOLIDWORKS 2023. <coughs> They're all gonna be good. <coughs> I gotta go. <laughs> gotta go? Oh, all right, folks. Well, Mark Isometric, thanks for being on the show, Mark. And for all of you in the audience, make sure to like and subscribe. Oh, well, that was sure cheesy. But SOLIDWORKS 2023 really delivers. You know, Michael, without your phone, you really are productive. <laughs> you know what? I think there's a bigger lesson here. When you're under a big deadline, just put it off. Don't worry about it. Just watch some CAD tube videos and it'll come to you. Oh. <laughs> nice work, Mark and Michael. In a conclusion that no one saw coming, the guys transformed from just watching videos to making them, inspired by the community to share their own creative efforts. 
all of which gave us a sneak peek of SOLIDWORKS 2023 and showed how the entire 3D Experience Works portfolio can transform the way you work. Congratulations, guys, you actually pulled it off. And SOLIDWORKS 2023 looks great. I can't wait to see what you come up with next year. Oh, and Michael, here's your phone back. Uh, no thanks. I'm breaking the habit and going back to CAD. Searching, breaking CAD. Oh, not again. I am the engineer. I am the one who designs. Do I have a plan, you ask? Yeah, SOLIDWORKS. Where are the models? Undefined sketches, dangling references, and no data management do not constitute designing in my book. It's always been one step forward and two I just back. You're an insane, degenerate model, and you deserve to be suppressed. We're released when I say we're released. I designed it for me. I liked it. I was good at it, and I was alive. Thank you all for having me back. I am always so inspired spending time with this phenomenal community. I hope to see you all next year in person, but first, I'll see you at the wrap this afternoon. Over to you, GP. Thank you, Tracy. What a great few days of imagining the future together. As we have seen, there is no single path to innovation, and it happens everywhere. We heard the great stories from uh, students, uh, makers like uh, Katie Reed, the startups like Rise Robotics, or long-time SolidWorks customers like uh, Stark Systems or Sasty Waste. In my new role, I will dedicate my energy and focus to making 3D Experience Works the greatest innovation platform ever developed. Collaborating with uh, Manish in his uh, new role as uh, the new uh, CEO of SolidWorks uh, and the other brands, I will ensure we expand the portfolio with the best tool for SOLIDWORKS users of all size to solve complex problems in design, simulation, manufacturing, marketing, and governance. On Monday, I announced a few of those new solutions. First of all, the CAM portion to the maker software, included now, same price, the phenomenal SOLIDWORKS cloud offer, and a special offer for, for line builders. Today, we have also heard from Sherry and Suchit of our next project with the Fab Lab Foundation for a new Fab Lab in Haiti with the sponsorship of the former ambassador, Paul Altidor. Stay tuned for our future projects with the Fab Lab Foundation. Let's take now a look at some of the other highlights. Welcome to everyone joining us at 3D Experience World 2022 from around the globe. In the age of experience, the challenge we have is to imagine in a record time, not only the products, but also to bring to life unique and meaningful experiences for your ultimate customers. From what I hear, you are my fellow nerd, so definitely let's nerd out. We are passionate about innovation because we know that innovation helps solve big problems. Each time I see these uh, creative projects combining art, science, and technology, I feel like mesmerized, like a, like a child. We are together because the magic of virtual worlds is to expand imagination. We're gonna bring you the shop floor virtually. Hey, welcome to the shop floor here at 3D Experience World 2022. We're trying to change the world just too early, but eventually many of us on that team went forward and, and created uh, the iPhone, and then from that also uh, Android. You two should keep the same SolidWorks DNA while you lead 3D Experience Works. As you said, 3D Experience Works is a natural expansion of SolidWorks. 
So we have a common mission. This software is designed to get out of the way of manufacturing and so that you can do what you love, which is machining. The fact that SolidWorks is developing these tools, uh, again, it's just a great, uh, great plus to be part of it. Dear friends, community of makers, startup, professional learners, we admire what you do. We are together and we are here with you and for you. While we have enjoyed connecting with tens of thousands of you virtually this week at 3D Spinless World, we also miss the energy and enthusiasm that comes with an in-person event. But speaking of energy and enthusiasm, there is a special person that showed up this morning, and I would like to have him here on stage with me. Joe, come over. You are not virtual, right? You well, I'm not real. virtual. <laughs> well, you know, it's hard to imagine. Am I, is it reality or is, am I virtual? I can't really tell. Technology is really something else. Yeah, I can tell you that you look so very much in person, as usual, Joe. So thank you for, uh, for coming. And, you know, I would like uh, to give you the privilege to announce uh, the next uh, in-person event. Tell everybody where we will be. Wow, this is awesome. Well, I'd like to say that it's going to all start start where it ended. We're heading back to Nashville. Uh -huh. So, see you in 3D Experience The music well. shooting. Shoot. <laughs> yep. Awesome. Thank you, Joe. Thank you for coming. Thanks Absolutely. a lot. Yep. I'll see you soon. For sure. All right. Very good. So, um, we will get back together in person, making new connections, and imagine even more possibilities moving forward. Start the planning for it now, please. Thank you for taking the time to join us uh, virtually this year. We look forward to seeing you in person next year in Nashville.